Okay, good morning. Um, it is Monday, uh, September 14th, and this will be the first video of the year. Um, I'm Mr. Rocco, for those of you that um, do remote only, and uh, those of you that come in person, um, as we have talked about, um, these will be, uh, videos will be dropped every, or posted every Monday morning. Uh, again, I'm going to make three videos uh, a week, three lessons. Um, the nice thing about videos, uh, screencasts, you can uh, pause, rewind, go back, you know, if something doesn't make sense, um, just go back and rewind uh, for the part you need to uh, check on, and then uh, that'll hopefully clear things up. So let's jump right in to Earth Science. Uh, these are the four fields of Earth Science, or four branches, geology, meteorology, astronomy, and oceanography. Um, just as a side note, this slides that say copy. These are ones that if you um, want to have a notebook next to you as you're watching these videos you can take notes on. Um, these videos will stay up on Canvas so you know it's entirely up to you if you feel that you know taking the notes will help you um, learn the material better that's that's up to you I would recommend that um, but if you feel like you're okay and you know you'll always have the videos I guess to go back and look at so I'll leave that up to your um, preference so any slides that say copy those are the ones in I guess we'll call it normal school um, I would have students copy off the board so let's go through each branch uh, of earth science at one at a time. So geology, uh, geo comes from the prefix, which means earth. And then anything ology means study of. So you're studying the, the surface of the earth and what's inside the earth. So these are things we'll cover in the spring. Uh, rocks and minerals, surface features, mountains, valleys, plateaus, um, things like that earthquakes, volcanoes, and fossils. So this is all stuff I tend to cover this stuff in March, April, and May. Um, this course is the Grand Canyon, which I, I haven't visited. Um, maybe some of you have, and that's the uh, Colorado River that runs through there. Uh, this is Mount Rushmore, which has the uh, four presidents, Washington, Jefferson, Roosevelt, and Lincoln. Um, that's in the Black Hills of South Dakota. And I forget where this picture came from, um, but this is also out west. Uh, these beautiful canyons, if you've ever been out to the western half of the United States. Uh, meteorology, which has nothing to do with meteors. <laughs> meteorology is the study of the weather. So it's weather, climate, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, thunderstorms, you know, ice storms, snowstorms, you name it. Um, I typically will cover meteorology in... Oh, January and February, which will be a good time to cover it because that's right in the middle of winter and uh, we could always talk about the current weather, which is great, snowstorms and things. Uh, here's a hurricane right here. And of course you have what's called the eye of the hurricane, which uh, some of you probably know is actually calm inside. Uh, no wind directly in the middle. It's sunny. You can look straight up to blue skies. Uh, the wall, which is just around the outside of the eye, that's the fiercest winds, the strongest winds right there. And then the winds will get um, will decrease as you go further from the eye of the hurricane. Um, tornadoes, of course, which have been um, pretty widespread this, uh, this year so far. Maybe not for Rhinebeck, but other parts of the country. Um, big difference is wind speed. Um, hurricane... Uh, as we talked about a little bit in class, uh, Category 5 can be 155 mile an hour sustained winds with a hurricane. That's a Cat 5. Tornadoes can go up to 250, uh, 275. So much, much faster winds, but they don't cover as much area, right? A hurricane can take out the whole coast of the United States or the, the, the Gulf Coast of, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Whereas a tornado is going to be very local, uh, might take out one neighborhood and not touch the next door neighborhood. So a big difference there. Um, there's an ice storm there, uh, so that would be a problem for that person's car. It's going to take a little while to thaw out. Uh, flooding, of course, during hurricanes and things, that can be a problem. And then uh, as we are used to uh, getting snowstorms, um, which uh, we'll see what this winter brings. I don't know, I keep getting conflicting reports. 
I think right now we're in uh, what's called they call La Nina, which there's two different types of uh, ocean situations. So they look at the Pacific Ocean. There's El Nino, and then there's La Nina. El Nino, which means boy, right in Spanish, that's when the ocean temperatures in the Pacific are above average. Uh, usually for us, that means a milder winter. Uh, rainy for the West Coast. Um, this year I did hear we were in a La Nina pattern, which means girl, and that's uh, typically a more active pattern for us, uh, a lot more uh, wet weather, which can mean a lot more snowstorms. So we'll have to just stay tuned and see what happens. Um, astronomy, which is going to be covered in uh, November and December. That is the study of the universe, so we'll talk about the planets, we'll look at the sun, um, and the layers of the sun, uh, different stars, which uh, some people forget that our sun is a star, just its average size, not the biggest, not the smallest, it's typical size. Uh, galaxies, ours is called the Milky Way, comets, and asteroids. Uh, this is, of course, Saturn, which has its rings. Those rings are made of very small rock particles. Uh, which are actually slowly, 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 slowly being pulled into the surface of Saturn. So in the future, not in our future, but way, way down the road, I'm talking probably millions, hundreds of millions of years from now, these rings will slowly disappear. They'll get pulled into the surface of Saturn. Uh, this is an image of the sun, which sometimes if you go on Google Images, I've had kids say, you know, Mr. Rocco, there's... Uh, I've seen the sun looks orange or like this or like green or blue. Why is that? They use different cameras for the um, pictures. So it depends. They might use different energy. They might take the, uh, an image of the sun using x-ray. They might take an image of the sun using gamma rays. Oh, not gamma rays. Uh, infrared. They might use ultraviolet. So they use different cameras uh, and different energies to take pictures of the sun. And, of course, this is a comet. Uh, the head of the comet is made of ice and rock material. And then you have a uh, very common in a comet is these tails, which these tails can go out off the head of the comet for millions of miles. And uh, that's all um, dust and debris that's been uh, blown from the head of the comet by the solar winds. So the sun creates this tail. Um, key thing about the tail, the tail always points away from the sun. It's like a shadow. If you go stand outside and you face the sun, right? Your shadow's gonna be behind you, opposite the sun. Same thing with the tail of a, of a comet. And this is Jupiter, um, which has these bands. These are different cloud bands uh, in the southern hemisphere. So here would be sort of, and sorry, it's just a little tough to draw with a mouse straight, uh, but that's uh, the equator. And in the southern hemisphere of Jupiter, you have the, uh, it's called the Great Red Spot. It's this 24-7, spiraling storm uh, it does go around it'll rotate around uh, Jupiter and I believe about three planet Earths you can fit one two three Earths inside that storm that's how massive Jupiter is and how massive that great red spot is and then the fourth branch is oceanography um, again I talked about El Nino and La Nina uh, plant and animal life, mm, I don't spend a lot of time on. That's really more in when you take living environment, or what they used to call biology. You'll spend a lot of time on that. Uh, we'll touch on global warming, or now even, I think they're getting away from global warming, the term. Um, you're, now they're using more climate change, because uh, climate change could imply um, hot and cold conditions, which is happening uh, across parts of the Earth. It's not all temperatures aren't going up. There's places where it's actually going down, but that's part of climate change. And then the pollution that, of course, uh, affects climate change. So we'll get into that stuff later in the year. And you've got different ocean life. Here's your uh, images of the Pacific Ocean. So this is South America here, uh, Central America, you know, United States would be up here. So you're looking at the Pacific Ocean in this area. And you've got El Nino, which is when the ocean, Pacific Ocean is warmer than average. And then you have La Nina when it's colder than average. So this year coming up, from what I just uh, heard the other day on the news, we're in a La Nina pattern where the ocean temps will be colder than average. And, of course, sharks, which always ends up on the news in the summer for different shark attacks. Um, again, as ocean temperatures continue to slowly climb, you know, sharks are definitely coming up this way. You know, maybe they stayed 
years past they would stay down in the Florida area, but now that even up here, uh, Long Island, uh, New Jersey, uh, Cape Cod, uh, the ocean temperatures are much warmer today than they were in years past, so the sharks are going to go with the warmer water. So they they end up up in our neck of the woods and not always in Florida. And that's why you tend, I think, to hear more about shark attacks up here as the, it's due to the ocean temps going up. All right, so let's get into observations. And again, I mentioned this the other day in person with uh, a few of my classes. Um, a lot of earth science is very similar to what you covered or concepts you covered in sixth grade if you had Mrs. Wilsey. Um, except we'll probably take it to the next level and just go in a little more depth or a little uh, more information, perhaps, with some things. So we start out uh, with observations. And this is what an observation is. It's a statement about what our senses tell us, right? You have your five senses, and that's what an observation is, using your senses. And here's our five senses. So it says our senses tell us what, um, about what we see, we can smell, we can hear touch, taste. So we have our five senses, and those are observations. Um, occasionally, um, one of our senses might not be working as well as it used to be, and so we have invented instruments, which we'll get into, that help us with our senses. Uh, or people that have uh, lost a sense, and then their other senses have to sometimes compensate, right? A person who can't see might have a very good sense of hearing or a person who can't hear has a very good sense of seeing can read lips things like that so sometimes when you lose a sense um, other senses will help compensate for that so these are just some examples of observation that tree on my front lawn is tall so i go outside i look at the tree on my front lawn i can see that it's a very tall tree Especially if I look at maybe my neighbor's tree, which is a baby tree and is not that tall. So by using my sense of sight, right, I'm making an observation. That tree on my front lawn is tall. Or I'm in Earth Science Lab and I pick up a rock and I can feel it. And maybe I, Mr. Rock will blindfold me so I can't see the rock, but I can feel it. Use my sense of touch and I can tell just from my sense of touch that the rock is round. So that's an observation. Or, sadly, <laughs> we didn't have the Dutchess County Fair this year. Hopefully it'll be back next year. But let's say I'm at the fair and I order some uh, french fries and um, I start eating the french fries and they put a lot, a lot of salt on them. So I say, the french fries taste very salty, right? So that's an observation. Using my sense of taste, I can tell they're very, very salty. So anything using a sense, whether I can see it, like number one, I can touch it, like number two, or I can taste it, like number three. Those are all observations. Um, and again, our senses don't make accurate observations, so we invented instruments. So again, when your senses start to go, especially me as I'm getting older and I don't see as well, so there's things that we have invented that help us to um, make our observations more accurate. So that's really the key there. Instruments help make things more accurate. So that's what we use them for. For example, sight, like I just mentioned. We have glasses, which I use, or contact lenses. We have the microscope, right? Scope means to look. Anything with the word scope in it means look, and then micro means small. So when you put things on a little specimen slide, right, like you did probably in middle school, that's looking at things very, very tiny, right? Microscope or telescope. So again, scope means look. Tele means beyond. So like a telephone, right? You call or you phone someone beyond your house, right? You're calling someone down the road or across the country. So telescope looks beyond, <coughs> excuse me, uh, what we can see. Or binoculars, right? Anything ocular, has to do with the eyes. So binocular, bi meaning two, right? You have one, two. So binoculars, looking at things, you know, far away, you know, when you're looking at the leaves as they're going to start changing color. So those are all instruments we use for sight. Touch, or maybe not to touch something, right? If there's something slimy or greasy or you don't want to put your hands on it, we use gloves, right, to protect our hands, especially right now with COVID. Uh, gloves are a big commodity 
using them to uh, protect your skin from touching the virus if it's on a surface. Uh, hearing my stepfather, who uh, sadly uh, passed away this past spring, um, not from COVID, but anyway, um, he used to have a hearing aid. Right? Hearing aids would help with um, being able to hear better. So he had a hearing aid in his ear, and that helped him to hear when we spoke to him. So those are these, again, all instruments to help his, it helped his sense of hearing become more accurate. Or smell, or maybe, um, yeah, so in your house for safety, a uh, smoke detector, right? You're asleep at night, the family's asleep, and uh, you have smoke detectors, or at least you should. Make sure you uh, change the batteries, right, if they're, if they're battery operated, um, if they're hardwired, you know, they still have a battery backup. Good to change those again. Usually they do it, <clears throat> excuse me, when uh, we're doing a time change. So as we change the clocks, which will come up in the beginning of November, that's usually a good time they tell you to remind you, you know, change your clock and also change all the batteries in your smoke detector. But that's going to pick up smoke, uh, the smell of smoke, a lot quicker than perhaps your nose might pick it up, especially if you're asleep and uh, you want to get out of the house safely. Um, the other thing, of course, is carbon monoxide. That's on, yeah. So you should also have these in your house, uh, especially in your basement by your furnace. Um, it's a good thing to have a carbon monoxide. I would have smoke detectors in each bedroom, uh, in the hallway, in the kitchen. I would have carbon monoxide in the basement near your furnace, um, places like that. Carbon monoxide, as you might be aware, is uh, odorless. You can't smell it. Uh, it's tasteless. It's not like, you know, when it starts picking up a high amount in your house, you can taste that carbon monoxide. Um, so you can't smell it, you can't taste it, but it will cause you, usually the symptoms, if you're starting to get a lot of carbon monoxide in your house, is uh, you start to get tired, uh, you'll get nauseous and um, dizzy, and then you usually just uh, go to sleep. You kind of pass out and uh, and uh, that's what ends up happening. Then you die of carbon monoxide poisoning, which can be very difficult. They're going to have to like, rush you to the hospital and get that out of your body as fast as possible. Um, so it's a good idea to have the carbon monoxide. Um, and make sure you do. You know, this is a good time as I'm going through these uh, notes to uh, just, you know, check your house, check with someone in the house. Make sure you have a good operating carbon monoxide. This one's okay, um, the one I have in this picture. The one, actually, I've talked to uh, firefighters. Uh, the one they tell you to actually have is one that's got a digital uh, display on it. And you plug it into the wall. It, it, it's plug-in, but it also has battery backup. It'll have a number on here. Usually that number should say zero. Um, so it's in the hallway uh, between all my bedroom and my children's bedroom. So it's plugged in there, and it should always say zero. Then you know everything's good. Um, taste. So... That's your last uh, sense. I guess I wouldn't use these, <laughs> but let's say not for tasting something, but let's say, um, you know, you want to tell if something is very spicy. You could use, and you probably use this in science class in middle school, litmus paper, which uh, will turn blue. You know, it's a pink strip of paper that'll turn blue. Um, it's going to tell you if something is very acidic or very basic. Um, you probably covered again in middle school. There's uh, the pH scale is called what? pH, pH, and again, sorry, I'm writing with the mouse, so it's a little tricky. So it goes from 0 to 14. Uh, 7 is neutral. Anything in the low end is going to be acidic. Anything up here higher than 7 is basic. So you're trying to keep something neutral, right? Um, you can test that uh, solution or whatever if you're in a science class with pH paper. With, uh, they call it pH paper, actually, or litmus paper. Uh, swimming pool. Some of you might have a swimming pool or a hot tub, and you want to check, uh, you know, you got to add chlorine, which can cause the pH level to fluctuate. So you want to uh, constantly check your swimming pool to make sure it's not too acidic, too basic, especially when you're, if you're swimming in a pool or sitting in a hot tub for quite some time, you don't want that on your skin if it's not the right level. All right, then you have what's called an inference. <clears throat> so an inference is actually an automatic, your brain does this right after an observation. So you might um, look at something or you can smell something or you, you know, 
you hear something and then your brain will go into a thought process and come up with a reason why something happened or what's going to happen next right so an inference let me go to the next slide is a statement about what did happen or what will happen based on what your sense has told you so you're you see something happen and then you wonder you know what happened or how did it happen or you see something happen and you're going to wonder okay what's going to happen next so you're making a prediction so inferences are guesses um you know a uh, forecast a weather forecast is a perfect example right i know you know today it's sunny out but what's the weather tomorrow so you turn on the news and the meteorologist gives you the forecast says hey tomorrow's going to be sunny and cool right they're making a forecast they're they're making an inference so you're constantly inferring right what's going to happen uh, when when uh, something you see something or you hear something or whatever using your senses and then making some kind of guess so these are just some examples of inferences, right? You Let's say you pick up a rock and the rock is round and smooth, right? You can see that it's uh, smooth or you can feel it, right? Maybe, again, you're blindfolded. You can tell it's round and smooth. <clears throat> but then you make a guess. You say, hey, I think this rock is round and smooth because, and there's the separation between the observation and the inference, right? This first part of the sentence, the rock is round and smooth, that would be the observation. So I'll put an O there. And then you say, because it was probably in running water for a long time. Now, did you see it in the running water? No. You picked up the rock in, in Mr. Rocco's classroom, and it's sitting on a lab table, and it's perfectly round and smooth. You're making a guess. How did it become round and smooth? So that guess is an inference. You're inferring that it was in running water. Right? Now, if, let's say, you change that statement and you said, I see the rock running down the stream or you know rolling down the stream that's different that's an observation you actually see it right now it's in the water and it's being carried by the stream that's all observation but if you just have a rock sitting in a science classroom and then you pick it up and say hey this rock's round and smooth okay that's the observation but then you say you know mr rock says well why do you think it's round and smooth now you go to the eye you go to the inference you say well i infer because it was in water running water right so you see the difference um, glacier made scratches so you don't see the glacier right you pick up a rock and that rock has a bunch of scratches on it so the, seeing the scratches that's the O that's the observation and then you're guessing hey all these scratches were made by a glacier and again glaciers were around tens of thousands of years ago at least about 20,000 15 20,000 years ago you don't see the glacier anymore you're not 15,000 years old obviously so you're making a guess you're making an inference how those scratches got there or actually i'm recording this on sunday morning uh the jets will be playing today and i'm a big jets fan and hopefully they win today we'll see but i make an inference you know maybe these first uh four five six games the jets are on a roll and they start winning a bunch of games and then i make an inference that the jets are going to win the super bowl this year right so that's an inference. So predicting who's going to win the Super Bowl, who's going to win the World Series, who's going to win the NBA title. Those are all inferences, right? Uh, today, I know later is uh, if you follow tennis, right? The men's uh, U.S. Open tennis match. So you're going to make an inference. You're going to infer who's going to win. Science class, you did uh, probably in middle school, you did what was called a hypothesis, right? The science teacher would set up and say, here's the experiment you're going to do. But let's make a hypothesis first. What do you th what do you predict's going to happen after you run this experiment, right? So a hy hypothesis is an inference, right? You're making a guess as to what's going to happen. So those are all examples of inferences. And then finally, classification. So when you classify, right? Think of your classes in school, right? They're separate subjects. You have science, you have math, you have English, you have social studies. You know, you are grouping your courses based on similar things right in earth science we talk about similar things all anything that has to do with the earth you know meteorology astronomy geology you go into a math class right it's all about number crunching you go into an ela or english class right you're dealing with writing sentences reading books writing essays so classification is just grouping objects or ideas with similar properties 
right? Think of the things you classify in your in your house. You classify your your clothes, right? You might have a drawer that has socks, a drawer that has t-shirts, a drawer that has pants. Um, you classify in the kitchen, right? You have a drawer that has silverware. Another drawer might have utensils. Um, in your refrigerator, you have a drawer that has fruits. Another drawer might have vegetables. Um, you might classify your cabinets in your kitchen. This drawer has the snacks, or this cabinet, I should say, sorry. This cabinet has, um, you know, all your sauces or, or, or soups, right? You classify that way. Uh, you classify your binder, right? You have dividers and you have a separate section in your binder for English, a separate section for math, etc. You know, why do we do it though? That's the question. What's the point of classifying? So actually, well, before I get to that, this is a classification of the red maple tree. So again, you probably covered this in middle school. You've got your kingdom, right? The red maple is a plant kingdom. It's not the animal. And these are characteristics. Anything that's in the plant kingdom is an organism that usually has a rigid cell wall and, and, and possess chlorophyll, right, for photosynthesis. Um, you got your sub kingdom, but usually that's separate. Uh, phylum, you probably talked about that. It's a vascular plant, right? You have your class. It's a flowering plant, seed enclosed in an ovary. Uh, order, it says soap berry order consisting of a number of trees and shrubs. It has a specific family, which is the maple family. Its genus is maples and a box elder, and then its species is the red maple, right? So you classify things by king specifics, going from a broad kingdom plant all the way down to a specific uh, species, right? putting into special classification. So here's why. Why do we do it? Uh, makes it easier right, for us to study, uh, more meaningful for him or her. Um, examples, he can, you can group large masses that orbit the sun. We can call them planets. Right? Um, this is where the discussion came in about Pluto back in 2006. Is Pluto a planet? And that discussion uh, ended up with Pluto being declassified or put into a different classification. Um, astronomers got together in Europe, I believe it was back in 2006, and they said, you know, in order, what is what defines a planet? And their definition of a planet was it had to have its own orbit and, and revolve around the sun, but it could not cross another orbit's uh, path, another orbit's, another planet's orbit. And so uh, Pluto crosses actually Neptune's path. Uh, several times as it goes around the sun and so astronomers put it up to a vote and they said well if Pluto crosses over Neptune's orbit is it really a planet and then they ended up getting voted out and they took it away uh, from the nine planets and that's why we're down to eight um, and people were very upset about this believe it or not and there were marches in Washington and bring back Pluto and you know you're giving Pluto a, you know a bad reputation blah 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 but <laughs> Uh, you'd think that was, you know, there's more important things in the world to talk about, but that's uh, what people were upset about Pluto. So then they said, all right, let's put it in a new category, and it is. Now it's considered what they call a dwarf planet. So there are dwarf planets um, that are put into the same category as Pluto. These are way in the outskirts of the solar system. Uh, there's other objects out there. Actually, many of your comets go into the same category as Pluto um, in this dwarf planet uh, category. Um, rocks. So there are three types of rocks you probably remember from middle school. You have rocks that have intergrown crystals and uh, mixed crystals are all glued together. So we're not glued together, but uh, crystallized together, I should say. And those are called igneous rocks. Right. And then you have rocks that form sediments like sand and stuff. Those are your sedimentary rocks. And you have rocks that form from heat and pressure. Those are your metamorphic rocks. So they put them into three different classifications. And then animals that honk, which are called geese which are definitely around the Rhinebeck area because you can find what they leave behind anyway so that is it for this first video uh, again I'm trying to keep them roughly a half hour each sometimes it might be slightly more sometimes slightly less um, so please again um, make sure you watch the videos uh, carefully you can pause rewind if something doesn't make sense um, and then what I'm going to be doing along with the three videos each week is again, I'm going to be posting uh, a homework for each video. So there'll be a homework that deals with this video. And then each of the other videos will also have its own homework. 
And that's the plan as we move forward. Three videos and three homeworks. Okay. Um, so great. Uh, hopefully this made sense. And I will put this video on Canvas for you to watch and listen and learn. All right. Thanks, guys. Talk to you soon. Bye.